Section seven of Christmas Comes But Once a Year by John Layton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Victoria and Albert slumber late on the morning of the fifth. Alfonso is the first up, or rather down, having rolled off his uncomfortable bed constructed upon four chairs in the drawing room. Mrs. Brown, too, must have risen on the wrong side of her tester, so testy is she this morning, thanking her stars that Twelfth Day has arrived to put an end to the Christmas miseries. Soon now will that little pest Tom be packed back to Tortwack House, and the juvenile party of to-day, it is hoped, may appease some rampant mamas uninvited to the Grand Réunion rendering any petty excuses that may be given the more feasible. The day rolls rapidly away, though not with half the speed Master Brown could desire, the hands of the hall clock appearing to creep, so that every time Tom passed it, and that was not seldom, he stopped to see if it was going, the day seeming most unusually long, and night as if it never would come. But it did. Firstly, bringing the little Merrys from Hope Cottage, the Tudor Lodge next door but one, Master Walter Merry being the first to answer Tommy's nubbly note of invitation in intoxicated text capitals that appeared to be making a desperate effort to run off the paper at the right-hand corner, leaving no room to remain, and scarcely any to please turn over, so folded was it to give the desired angular form that the paper looked as if it had been used to make five hundred geometrical cocks and boats. Tom met the Merrys with such fervent joy that he never thought they had healths or anything else to ask after, his only object seeming to be the finding of his friend, who is rolled like a mummy in numberless boas and shawls. During the process of unswathing, which was no easy job to one in a hurry, so artfully were the pins introduced, Master Tommy treats his friend Walter to a railroad retrospective review of the good things in store, recounting all the lummy things left yesterday, telling about the knobby Christmas tree Captain de Camp gave them, though his ma did say it was a pretty give, it was stolen out of his father's garden. "'My father's a jolly sight richer than yours. "'He has more trees in his garden. "'Ain't we got a swag of nuts and a plummy twelfth cake? "'My father won it at an art union in the city. "'I am to draw king if I don't just see how I'll cry. "'Mercy, Mary, shall be queen. "'You shall have punch off the cake, "'and Ma says I shall have rule Britannia "'as soon as the waves and ice have melted away.' Now a knock brings more visitors, the master's young, in all the ungainliness of hobbledehoyhood, that transmigratory period when coat-tails are first developed. They have come with their sister Flora, a lovely bud, expected out next season. Here are the bells, the patees, and the little larks, with their big brother, the jolly lark, who made his debut over the top of the drawing-room door, standing upon the shoulders of your humble servant, who felt the jolly lark anything but light and no joke, though the juveniles must have thought it so, for we could hear their merry peals of laughter ringing joyously, dispelling the silence that had hitherto prevailed overturning the sage injunctions of proper mammas who teach their children to behave pretty, thinking good and quiet synonymous. Somehow the little fellows unfortunately take the lark for Mr. Spoaf, who has hitherto done the funny in a refined style scarcely to be imagined, an elegant amiable fun, a mixture of the buffoon and gentleman, the sublime and the ridiculous, quite marvellous to behold, making our little friend, who you are aware was moulded in one of nature's odd freaks, appear to tender imaginations almost supernatural. The mistake and misplaced approbation is very galling to Mrs. Brown, 
so much so that she becomes angry with the tea-urn, and in turn burns her fingers, venting her ire in the shape of a box on the ears of Master Bold, who ventured to hint Mr. Spoaf's absence a jolly shame, and now vows to tell his mamma, a thing it is very evident Mrs. Brown does not wish, for she has shown a great deal of favour and contrition towards the young gentleman since. The tea-tray having been removed, the burners of the chandelier heightened, and the Snuffle family had their row of little noses polished by the eldest sister, preparations begin, Miss Jemima playing the pretty little hop-o'-my-thumb polka, and Tom, who has been sitting very quietly beside Mercy Mary, vowing to marry her at fourteen, for his father is so rich that he would give him five pounds a year to live upon, leads off, much to the mortification of those boys who will not be young gentlemen, the many who won't, can't, and shan't dance, but being bent upon mischief, dispose explosive spiders and chair-crackers about the carpet. One little mischievous fellow, wishing he had brought some pepper to strew on the floor and make him sneeze. However, they get up a little excitement another way with the sofa pillows, a sham fight, in which a Parian Amazon falls beside Marion Bell, who didn't go to do it. So dancing is relinquished for games to suit all parties. Hunt the slipper, a sport carried on with great spirit, until it is found there are slippers enough for three, a thing everybody holds to be cheatery. So that game is abandoned for blind man's buff, the mere mention of which carries us back to childhood, and, as authors often lug in their thoughts bits of nature, very unceremoniously and at odd times, we may possibly be pardoned or praised for so doing. Well, we never hear mention of this game, but we think of a bump we once received during the sport, our blind ardour causing us to flounder in a fender and bruise our head, the remains of which will be taken to the long home. Well do we remember the spotted turban worn on that occasion, for we recollect at the time thinking belcher a new term just coined, having our crown rubbed with brandy and taking a little internally, which appeared attracted by that externally, for it got in our head and made us very merry, causing the hiccups to such an extent that we were called Sir Toby Belt of Twelfth Night, or what you will notoriety, having drawn that character. Thus, brandy, belchers, and blind man's buff hold an indissoluble partnership in our memory, a remnant of those days when we imagined a Jew incapable of dealing in other merchandise than old clothes, or of shaving like a Christian, or, if he did, would do other than expose a pendant chin resembling the vertebrae of a horse's tail. Oh, those days have flown, days when we imagined peas split by hand, and thought humanity fools for not making soup with whole ones. But we are sadly digressing. It's not fair, cried twenty voices. The blind man can see. And so he could, for he always caught Miss Brown, who, afraid of the piano or pier-glass, would stand in the way. So that sport is relinquished for cake and characters, the former seeming to afford great gratification, and the latter little, save to the king and queen, all other characters being, like the riddles, given up no one caring to know when a sailor is not a sailor, when he's a bored, or to be bored with a door's being a jar and a man a shaving. The rich cake is soon a ruin. So much is every part of it relished 
that one young gentleman has consumed the head and shoulders of Madame Malboni under a delusion of her being sugar and not plaster of parish, as Mrs. Brown afterwards said it was. The little fellows soon get very mirthful on the ginger wine, keeping up a continual buzz like a colony of bees, sadly itching to be at something. A wish that is not to be realised at once, for little Miss Newsoints is going to do that eternal tattoo, the ratter plan. Yes, there she is in Tom's felt hat and polonaise as La Vivandière, thumping upon an empty bandbox with two knitting pins, singing, as some of the mamas say, very prettily, but as the boys, who have heard it many times before, designate it, a jolly bother, a great big shame, a precious dummy set out, and so on, there being no fun in it. This humdrum over, a great cry is raised for forfeits, and a desire that a lady should go out in a very great hurry, as it would appear almost in a state of destitution, for every young lady and gentleman proffers to stand for some article of dress. Having settled what they will give, all sit round upon chairs ready to hear the lady's demands. Spin goes the trencher, and she wants her stockings. Forward fly the hose, personated by a little fellow with mottled legs who had never stood in other than socks, but for all that can catch the revolving waiter, look slyly at Bonnet, make him think it his turn, and impudently call out, Cap! So Bonnet and Cap knock head to head, tumble on the trencher, and get fined. Bonnet shouts, Boots! Boots begets bustle, and bustle begets a grand stir by calling double toilet, causing the whole wardrobe to leap from every chair in every direction, a general confusion in which the boa slips off his seat and forfeits a twenty-bladed knife. The boa, spinning the tray again, calls muff, who, not being on the alert, arrives when the waiter has wobbled its last, so the muff has to pay a forfeit, but having nothing eligible upon his person, is found a substitute in a very ugly china pug-dog, afterwards called a very pretty thing by Miss Angelina to Miss Jemima, who awarded the penalties like a blind justice saying her prayers, passing sentence in the lap of the judge, who demands, Here's a pretty thing, a very pretty thing, and what is the owner of this very pretty thing to be done to? Angelina sentencing the owner of the pretty pug to take a very pretty young lady into the corner and spell opportunity. A spell the muff does not seem to know lies in taking the opportunity to kiss the fair one, though he has all the evening been admiring her vastly and would have given anything for such a chance. But next, having to lie the length of a looby, the breadth of a booby, etc., he is eminently successful. Yet who shall say the ungainly cub may not one day be an ornament to society? Poor Muff! He has no mother or sisters. The only specimens of girlhood known to him are the maids at home and the schoolmaster's daughter that dines with the parlour boarders at Addle House. Brave boy, thou art clever but semi-civilised. More pretty things are being redeemed, fans, gloves, lockets, handkerchiefs and chatelaines, all their owners being appropriately done to, the boa condemned to bite a yard off the poker, and the visite to salute the one he likes best, which garters fancies will be her, so she embraces the table-pillar, and he, the bertha, instead. 
kissing her, sadly to the mortification of garters, who did think the honour worth some trouble. Jemima and Angelina, having disposed of the judicial pawnbrokering establishment, stroke down their skirts and send round the currant wine, whilst Master Tom and a few other daring youths consume lighted candle-ends made of turnip with almond wicks, and the merry little man Lark, who can no more be quiet than a robin in a rat-trap, is now hopping with a paper tail composed of this evening's sun, a sun that seems to be incombustible, for the boys are trying to ignite it, but cannot, only waxing Mr. Lark's pantaloons very much in the rear and putting the candles out, a trick that caused no end of diversion, not only to the performers but to everyone, who laughed immoderately, more particularly when Mr. Lark led down Mrs. Brown to supper, the antimacassar adhering to his trousers, the wax upon sitting down causing it to stick there. This brings us to the supper-table and the Christmas tree with its blossoms of light, a very peculiar species of shrub. We have heard of box-trees, plain trees, ladies' slippers and sunflowers, but never remember to have seen or heard of a toy and candle tree figured in any work on botany. Nor should we have thought our little friends had ever beheld one before, for the brilliant supper seemed but small attraction compared with the illuminated fur. All eyes appeared attracted to the quarter in which it stood and when the youthful company were introduced to it after the banquet, we felt glad the lower boughs were out of the reach of the younger branches, or they might in their eagerness have pulled it out of the disguised tub. As it was, some of the recipients took the fruit intended for others. Stephen Sharp ate all Miss Stanby's basket of sweets, and then demanded the story-book that had his name attached to it. All the fruit was not edible, for we saw an apple that tasted very much of the wood, being full of pips resembling dolls' tea-things, whilst upon suction the pears emitted musical sounds, and a biffin like a pincushion had the flavour of bran. Probably it was brand new. The tree, now stripped, is quite devoid of interest, for upon Mr. Lark starting some fun in the corner, none lingered by, not even to listen to the bird organ that appeared to play under the table. Yes, there was Lark at it again, doing anything to please. Generous Lark! his face covered with a white handkerchief, a portion tucked in his mouth, over all wearing a pair of spectacles, with pupils, currants abstracted from a mince pie, stuck thereon, causing the lark to look very curious and odd, the children wondering what he will be at next. For now, you must know, he has gone to prepare another excitement, being in the drawing-room, whilst the visitors are in the parlour, curious beyond all description, beseeching the junior Mr. Brown, who was standing with his back against the door to prevent egress, just to permit them to depart, which, after a slight contest, he does, they rushing pell-mell to the drawing-room, there to find an old birch broom blazing in the grate, and the recess covered with two sheets, suspended by forks. In front of the sheets is a table, whilst in front of that table stand the wondering little crowd, speculating as to what the burning broom can have to do with it, when a dwarf old dame appears through a slit in the drapery, as perfect a dwarf as ever breathed, but three feet high, and so really true that no one for a moment doubts her identity or vitality. "'She is a witch!' cry all, "'that has come down the chimney.' 
the dame bows acquiescence with numberless curtsies telling the little company of her immense age and adventures recounting her history about the large family she kept in the shoe about the refractory pig that would not get over the stile and her wonderful travels to sweep cobwebs from the sky so after having danced a hornpipe deplored the loss of her carriage broom demanded the grunting pig behind a curtain to be quiet and scraped an infinity of curtsies she vanishes the sharpest boy in the room master bold rushing downstairs to catch a glimpse of her but only seeing us in our shirt-sleeves wonders the more par parenthese we were one of the performers escaping to make room for the galanti show so whilst we leave the company to be amused thereby we will with the kind permission of mr lark instruct you how to construct an old dame and afterwards tell the effect it had upon our audience firstly procure a pair of small shoes and stockings these place upon your hands which are to represent feet next tie round your neck a short coloured pinafore reaching down to your hands or rather the old dame's feet this will represent a gown now place your shoed hands upon a table to see effect gird the gown with a proportionate apron the strings of which will bind your arms and body together at the chest put on a false nose a pair of spectacles a lady's frilled nightcap and a comical conical hat add a little red cloak and draw the table up to a window or recess the curtains of which pin at the back of your shoulders and standing thus with your hands the old dame's feet upon the table you will represent the most perfect little dwarf without arms you can imagine the hands are to be supplied by an accomplice behind the curtain who is to suit the action of those hands to the pleasantries you may invent thus having given the necessary instructions we leave the rest to be supplied by the actor who may if he pleases render the old dame a medium of much merry conceit and pleasant mirth well do we remember the impression made at this party for as before stated we performed the arms from behind the curtain through which we occasionally peeped getting a good view over the shoulders of mr lark the old dame witnessing the astonished gaping gaze of the servant who happened to enter the apartment at the moment and stood transfixed to the spot until the effigy had escaped one little boy was so impressed with the illusion that he actually went below with some venturesome companions in search of her but soon returned rushing upstairs in a state of extreme terror declaring to us as he kept his eyes towards the door fearing every moment she would appear that he had seen the old dame and heard her pig the truth being one of the party had grunted in a dark corner of the lobby and frightened the youth who eventually became a prey to intense mental anxiety a trembling fear we attempted to dispel without success until we bore the little fellow below he clinging tightly to us in the lobby mr lark showed the scared youth our trick piecemeal in the end pacifying the young gentleman though much do we think the old dame and her pig will never be forgotten by him he may grow to manhood have children loves and cares innumerable traverse the seas no war and famine yet do we think the old dame will stand boldly out like a giant image in the desert of the past far more so than the galanti show exhibited afterwards because really alive 
and capable of reason. Though we had more reason to remember the show, for the men who performed it hung their hats and coats beside Mr. Lark's and our own, which upon leaving they did not identify. Though we think they ought, as ours were considerably newer, one of their hats being a cap, and the other of dirty white felt. After the departure of the show, we got up some sport with the sheets upon which it had been performed, exhibiting our eyes through a hole therein, those on the obverse trying to guess the proprietor of others on the reverse, all the owners of bright eyes much enjoying the sport. But to recount the many pranks played by youthful blood that evening would require a volume, everybody proposing everything, and everybody else disliking the thing proposed suggests some other, one wanting hunt the whistle, a second to act charades, and a third some practical joke of the old school, such as the game we played with Mr. Lark, called Porcelain Mesmerism deceiving the little innocents into a belief that men are simple, much more so than they will find them upon arriving at maturity. There we sat, two full-grown fools, staring at each other with plates of water in our hands, the bottom of one sooty, the other clean. There we sat, face to face, alternately rubbing the bottoms of the plates, and stroking our physiognomies in mockery of each other, Mr. Lark getting his face blacked like a sweep, the youngsters laughing at his silliness. Oh, that a little smut should produce such ecstatic mirth! There is Walter Merry, looking like an eel in convulsions, imagining he has been here about an hour. You should have seen the expression of the little fellow when Mrs. Brown gently tapped him on the shoulder, saying, Master Mary, you're fetched. Time was annihilated, and memory dumbfounded. The entertainment that had been looked forward to for days, counted by the hours, and put so many mamas in a pother, is gone. The hands of the hall clock are almost perpendicular. It wants but half an hour of midnight. Several anxious mamas have sent several times for their several little ones, and the several servants have been sent away with several evasive answers, for the little dears are enjoying themselves so much. Mrs. Brown's compliments to Mrs. Fidgets, and would she permit the little Fidgets to stay just ten minutes longer? No, the fidgety footman is only to depart with them, so he is sent to the servants' hall there to wait, whilst Snapdragon is being prepared in the library, that the evening may end with a grand blue fire tableau. The room resembles the black hole of Calcutta. Hundreds of little itching fingers are longing to be amongst that pound of raisins in spirits, all eager as imps for the fiendish sport, the darkness and suspense rendering it very exciting, causing Master Jewel, a model boy who is wanted directly to make no answer from the sable mass, until the summons being repeated, he says something that sounds very like, Shan't come! And Master Jewel does not come, until he has had his portion of the fiery food that is flying about in every direction. End of section 7